I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Duluth school board leaders are here to talk about the decision to turn down a purchase offer for the former Duluth Central property. The site would have been used for the new Edison Charter High School. Duluth's 148th fighter group has been called to active duty in South Korea. We'll learn more about the deployment. And a look at the week's business news and a story from 25 years ago in our news file. So these topics and more coming up now on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. We've had a little bit of everything weather-wise on this first day of April, Julie. Yeah, it's an April Fool's trying to trick you into thinking it's spring. Mama Nature got a little <laughs> April Foolish this morning. We had pretty good uh, snowfall here for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, indeed. We did out at our house for sure. Yeah, well, we got a packed show. Let's get started. All right. Thank you, Denny, and welcome, everyone. A week that began with a public meeting about the potential sale of school district property to a competing charter school ended with a split vote Thursday of the Duluth School Board. The board voted 4-3 to three against selling the former Duluth Central High School site to a group that would have brought Duluth Edison's Charter High School to the property. Selling the school to a competing entity would have required suspending school district policy. And joining us to talk more about that decision is David Kirby, Vice Chair of the Duluth School Board. And Annie Harla is the chair of the Duluth School Board. And thanks to both of you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you for inviting us. David, there was a lot of public pressure on the board as this decision was about to be made. What in your mind swayed the decision not to negotiate a sale? Well, I think there were uh, several things. We looked at um, the potential benefit of a offer that the Edison people had made and uh, compared that to with the long-term effects that would have had. Uh, we looked at the fact that a third high school had been debated before for, that, for Duluth and had been rejected and what the effect of a high school there would have been on uh, Western Duluth and Denfeld especially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Annie Harlow, what, what in your mind was the deciding factor? You know, for me as I look down at the, at the numbers that the site itself, it's, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of facts that were in front of us. We, we are looking at a deficit. That's something that is something that we as a board are, are very concerned about and are looking at how we can streamline services. I do know that an offer of $14.2 million looks very enticing, but the $14.2 million is the property in what it's worth not in use as a school. And so for me, the in use, the actual number in use as a school was about $30.3 million. And so seeing the the change in what the actual use is for sure. was there. And also, you know, looking at the opportunities that we have in our community for um, redeveloping the site. Yeah. Um, it, needs be, it needs to be back on the tax rolls as well. Before we continue, I do want to say that the Duluth Edison Charter Schools did send us a comment, mm -hmm. on, and I'd like to read that right now. This is from Board President Crystal Palmer of Duluth Edison Charter Schools. And the, the charter school says, we thank Independent School District 709 for its openness and deliberations regarding the offer to purchase the central property. There was good community discussion about this and we respect the school board's decision to decline having a Duluth Edison Charter School there. We can now return our focus to working with Tisher Creek Duluth Building Company to construct a high school at our Snowflake location. Our timetable has not been affected, so we are still on track to be open in August 2017. That from Crystal Palmer, Board President, Duluth Edison Charter Schools. David, how is the school board now going to market the property? Well, we're working with some um, uh, groups, including the county and the city, who will hopefully be much more involved than they have been in the past. And there's an advisory group that's working with the school district to help market this. It uh, is a better time to market it. When the school first closed, there was an economic downturn. Of course, that affected everything. And so those are a couple of the ways that we're doing this. Maybe Annie has. Huh. 
Well, and I know that you know it's been the, it has been on the market for six years. It took about three years to rezone it, and, and we had one offer that had been we had accepted for the property, and so <laughs> and that had been the whole the property as a whole. So we'll be looking to work with the city to break it into three parcels uh, and find different ways, um, yeah. unless there's a buyer interested in the whole piece, as well as work to partner, like David said, with city and county partners looking for DITA assistance and, and the potential of a district, TIF district. Are there any offers hiding in the wings that you're familiar with? You know, I've, mm -hmm. I've heard that there's been some buzz in our community, but nothing has come officially to the board yet. Mm -hmm. The sale, of, of course, of Central was such a big part of the, the Red Plan financing. Um, does the board feel a, a sense of obligation to get the thing sold to somebody pretty soon? Well, I think that we want to get it sold in a way that will benefit the community. Uh, selling it for a dollar or 14 million doesn't make sense given the, the uh, value of the property and what it can be developed for and what potential is. Uh, and that 14 million would not go far given the, gr the big budget that the school district has. But the, it, when you talk about splitting the property up, that could have been one potential thing that you looked at in terms of selling the school building to the Edison folks and then retaining some of that Ridge property and selling it to a housing developer and maybe maximizing everybody's use of that property. You know, at the timeline that we were on with making the decision at the request of um, the other organization, I th we, we don't have all those properties officially yeah. split up. And so part of the areas that we do need, um, you know, support in, in making, making sure that the parcels are broken up. Which brings the question, are the buildings on site being cared for or are they deteriorating? They, you know, we are keeping them, we, are keep, we keep them heated in the winter, but there is some deferred maintenance that has happened um, with the large building especially, but the STC building, the, that lower building, mm -hmm. um, it has been kept up. Mm -hmm. One is being used by the district now for mm -hmm. maintenance and so it's being, part of it's being used. Mm -hmm. This whole conversation brought up the discussion of the district's policy to not sell buildings to other schools, schools. or educational um, facilities. Has the district suffered from selling some of its schools to other schools in the past in terms well, of Well, I was not on the board when the policy was made, but certainly I've asked about that and uh, people have told me that there was community input into making that policy because there were some drawbacks, I guess, to selling um, schools to other schools. Um, what was it, Lowell School where... Uh, Sold to Lakeview Christian Lakeview Academy, Christian Academy and, then, uh, and St. Michael School, I think, on the east side of town. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So there were some yeah. comments about that, and that was the policy was made in part, I'm told, in result uh, the result of uh, community input. They didn't mm -hmm. like those. Historic Central, the old Central downtown, mm -hmm. needs like 18 million dollars in repairs. Are those repairs going to be made, and where's the money coming from? So I, that I would say that our board needs to. That needs to be a bigger public discussion, and that was one of the reasons that, as we look at the at our 10-year capital facilities plan, that we need to bring to the public to talk about who's how we're going to be doing that. We've we've talked as a board about ideas of maybe trying to get funding from different areas to to find to to do that. But if we weren't um, maybe looking at uh, it is a historic building, and so finding some historical maintenance funds, but. Um, at the moment, it needs we need it needs to be brought back out to the public. Does the board see another bonding issue being brought up before the voters at some particular time? Well, uh, that hasn't been raised. At Not this on point. the table right Not now. Not at this no. point that I found. No. No. Mm -hmm. Not with regard to building. Yes. Yeah. How how much of a threat um, is it to the Duluth School District that Edison has been fairly successful in its program and is is developing this high school program? You know, I would say that as actually as we look at the numbers and the outcomes of our students, we're pretty on par. But the numbers of students that we are that we're serving have a lot of different outcomes. So if you look at our subgroups, we see some they're seeing success in different subgroups of students. I would say they have a strong marketing plan. And so as the Duluth School Board, we and the Duluth Schools, we do have a task of marketing our schools better and telling the full story of what's actually available in our schools. But you know. Uh, there's only so many students that are available where we have declining youth numbers in general statewide and in Duluth. And so there's only so many ways you can cut the pie. And at some point in time, um, we do see a loss and we, and we do see a loss in our overall revenue as well as see a significant portion of funds go out the door of our general fund to support additional programming for them. Mm -hmm. As a public entity, what, what about the whole 
conservation argument that, that has maybe been raised with the Edison School um, building out on the Snowflake site uh, that perhaps it would be better to to use the existing school building and infrastructure that's already in place rather than cutting down trees and taking out trails and, and having to deal with wetlands issues out there. Well, I think that that's a reasonable um, issue, except that's not our issue. Our, our obligation to the students of ISD 709 uh, Edison bought that property. Uh, they knew that was there, and we can't solve their problem for them. The district has a $3.3 million budget deficit right now. Uh, how are you working to solve that? We've had many, our administration and staff have had many meetings. They work um, alongside teachers and um, principals, many of our, and our units, to make sure that we were cutting cutting positions that were outside of the classroom. So it, the cuts haven't uh, directly affected any of our student to teacher ratios for the coming year. So class sizes will not be growing. Uh, and really, we're looking at ways to streamline some programs, cut. So we had made some initial investments in a, in a group that had, that had been doing some mentoring to teachers in the district, not meant um, doing some support for teachers in the district. And un unfortunately, it's not able to be in our budget in the coming year. but. The skills that they did bring are have been instilled in, in other people mm -hmm. around the district. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the biggest issues heading into the next few years for the Duluth School District? Well, I think uh, uh, marketing, all of the good things we do, I don't think it gets out enough. Uh, the Denfeld Robotics team is in the national championships. I mean, there's lots of things that uh, the people in the schools know about, but the people outside the schools mm -hmm. don't. I think that the people of Duluth have to realize that the kids that they're supporting now could be their heart surgeons 30 years from now. Uh, even though they don't have kids in the schools, it's important that they support the schools. It's an infrastructure just like the police or firemen, anybody like that. So I think we have to market them better. And I think we have to be uh, uh, judicious with our dollars. We have to look for more dollars. Uh, is, is there money available to hire a marketing agency to uh, instruct the Duluth School Board as to how to market better? I mean, we, we have the ability to work within our, within our, um, within our budget to do that. Uh, I think we could also bring, we have a lot of firms in town that may be willing to join a community group on it. And I think one of our biggest things when we look at issues with the coming year is find ways that the question isn't always, well, what's the issue with the Duluth Schools now? We need to move past that. Our community needs to work on, for internally as a district and externally, how are we rebuilding the culture around education in our community? And one thing I've been thinking about this week, you know, Monday night we had 400 people sitting in a room. Sure. And they were there talking, you know, pro selling Central to Edison, ag against selling Central to Edison, but everyone in the room was there about education. And as a community, we need to find that value again and find core beliefs back in this, in this students and you know as we look at diversified funding for education statewide we struggle because you know we are trying to compare apples to apples mm -hmm. but we have a we have a job as a do school board to market and support our community and um, find ways to change the culture and all we right. can do that all right Annie Harla chair David Kirby vice chair school board thank you so much for coming in and sharing your insights thank, thank you, you. Annie sure. David thank you <laughs> thank you so much for having us Now, let's dig into our news file archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. With a police escort, the 109th arrives on the outskirts of the Twin Ports. For the soldiers, it's their first glimpse of home. And for some waiting to greet the unit, it's a sign of hope. Their children are still in the Middle East. Feels great, yeah, you betcha. Sure, I mean, what, what can a guy say? This is what you've been waiting for for a while now. And then I'll be a heck of a lot happier when, when mine come home too, you know, like probably next month or something. The buses continue to move through town, stopping occasionally to see well-wishers. On board the bus, the soldiers are overcome by the turnout of people. I think we're pretty surprised. We, didn't, we had, really didn't expect uh, the homecoming that we've gotten. It's fantastic, it really is. It's, uh, they're all over the place. Everywhere you look, there's flags, there's people waving, they're giving us a thumbs up. It's, uh, it's pretty emotional. 
These soldiers have been overseas for about five months, and the feelings they are experiencing are evident in their expressions. Only last week they were seeing desert sand, but now it's familiar landmarks. Outside, the excitement is equally intense. Patriotic music sets the tone for this portion of the welcome home, just a start to what's ahead for the returning soldiers. Joe Thornton, KDLH News. Minnesota Air National Guard's 148th Fighter Wing, based here in Duluth, is being called up for a mission in South Korea. About 300 members of the 148th and a dozen F-16 aircraft will be deployed to Osan Air Base, about 40 miles from Seoul, South Korea. In a news release, the Air Guard said the wing's mission will be to provide security for the U.S. Pacific Command and Pacific Air Forces. Joining us with more on the deployment, is Lieutenant Colonel Rob Ronigan of the 148th Fighter Wing. Colonel, the wing has been preparing now for some time. What does it take to prepare for a mission such as you're going to be undertaking? There's a, there's a lot to it. Um, first of all, we have to figure out exactly where we're going, what, how much, uh, what's available at the, at the location, and then um, develop our plan for that for that location. We also prep our jets and prep our people. It's a lot of specific training that we do to go overseas for our people and uh, also prepare our aircraft. You've been to Osan before? Yes, I have. Is, is it a good fit for Duluth? It is a good fit. Um, we've done lots of um, deployments, as you know, in the last few years. Yeah. We've been to Af Afghanistan, Iraq. We, two years ago, we went to Europe and did a tour in Europe. Now we're going there, so that it's going to bring us to a broad Overall, you know, we've been all around the world and we can support anything that happens. Mm -hmm. Is this a, a routine deployment or is this really directly in response to some of the saber rattling that you see going on in North Korea right now? This has been going, this, we've been planning this for over a year. This has nothing to do with any current situation there. Mm -hmm. This is just a normal uh, deployment, the TSP deployment or the theater security package. Mm -hmm. But the instability that's kind of occurring there, does that send you in with a, a different set of orders or a different set of, a uh, different mindset? No, no, it really doesn't. Um, it's, uh, you know, something that's been going on there for quite a while, sure. and, and it just, uh, it's part of the deal. What do you do during a deployment? Will your F-16s be flying missions there? Yes, we'll be flying missions just about every day. Uh, we'll be training, and uh, the, the great thing is, is we'll be able to uh, work with our Air Force counterparts, with the Korean Air yeah. Force, and uh, be able to get uh, some interoperability with that. I mentioned that Osan Air Base is about 40 miles from Seoul. Mm -hmm. How far are you from the North Korean border? We're about 60 miles from the North okay. Korean border. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the, the F-16 capabilities, and when you say you're flying missions, what does that mean? Um, well, we're there mostly f to uh, do the, uh, our, our primary focus will be the seed mission or suppression of any enemy air defenses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll be doing that, working that's, that's really, that type of mission is a real team effort with other, all kinds of other aircraft. And so that's why we'll be working with, directly with um, the U.S. forces there um, to include the Air Force and the, the Navy and the Marines and everybody there, plus the Koreans, and putting together those type of uh, training op opportunities. Mm -hmm. you, you'll be there for several months, what, four? Yes. And then are you following someone, another, another uh, wing, and then will somebody follow you? Yeah, yes. There's, uh, there's, uh, another, there's another wing there at a different location in, in the Pacific Theater. And then there'd be a, a, a unit coming following us mm -hmm. also, mm -hmm. somewhere in theater, so. You mentioned that you've been deployed an, a number of times, but I, I imagine that it's, it's a real different thing moving from life here in Duluth, Minnesota, to moving across the, the globe into uh, some sort of a mission situation. What do you do to mentally prepare for that? Well, yeah, first of all, it, it really helps to, uh, number one, like I said, the training. We're all trained. We know what to expect when we go there. We do that. The, the other biggest thing, I think, is, uh, is having that, the, the family and community sport that we get here. I mean, that's the big thing, knowing that if there is issues that we got at home, there's, there's people here to take yeah. care of it. We've got infrastructure within the wing, you know, friends, family that sort of thing. That, that's what's important to me. Mm -hmm. Are you able to communicate with family while you're we, Yes, we'll have. Um, South Korea, I think, is one of the most technologically advanced countries, so there's Wi-Fi everywhere there. Yeah. 
and cell phone coverage, so yes. We don't generally think about that in, in, the, in the Koreas, uh, so technologically advanced. Can you give us some example, Colonel, as to the size of the Osan Air Base and uh, how many other people you'll be working with? I, I don't know exactly, but many I think thousands? there's probably 4,000 people okay. there at that base, somewhere roughly around there. and. Uh, so we'll add another, uh, we'll, we'll add a whole another fighter squadron to it. There's two fighter squadrons there, so we'll add a, another whole fighter squadron. So there's a couple that are permanently Correct. stationed yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, active duty air yes. force. Mm -hmm. Anything that the soldiers have to do to get ready to go in terms of uh, taking care of medicines or shots or, or oh, yeah. just yeah, to well, prepare there's them? So, there's um, yeah, a whole bevy of shots <laughs> that all the airmen have to get. And you know, for one, for example, is uh, a, a theater specific is uh, Japanese encephalitis. Mm -hmm. We have to go through a couple of rounds of that and uh, lots of the other standard type uh, immunizations we go through. Mm -hmm. I think for many years um, people joined the National Guard because they wanted to get their college paid and there wasn't really much of a threat of ever being deployed and that seems to have changed quite a bit in the last 20 years or so. Um, are people entering the National Guard these days with uh, maybe a, a different expectation of what's going to happen to them? Well, I think absolutely with 9-11 and what happened after that, mm -hmm. you know, there's a whole different mindset. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is, you know, a volunteer thing, um, uh, deployment, and we've got plenty of volunteers to go. Mm -hmm. So well, th that's never been a problem with our unit. Now that you know a date, are the people in the wing uh, pretty excited? Oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's ready to time. We're, we're ready to go employ now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's time to get moving and go employ. You know, after a whole year of prepping, and working, it's time to get going sure. and do the mission. Mm -hmm. Did you know that whole time that this is where you were going to be going? Um, well, we knew we were going in theater, and uh, there was a couple of different options that they had for us, and uh, this one kind of they um, came just down the line here not too long ago. So. Mm -hmm. And I understand you're heading out tomorrow? I am, yes. Mm -hmm. Have yeah, everything's I'm going in order? Yeah, i get everything ready. So, so you are going to, North Korea, or to South Korea uh, early? Yes. Yeah, we, we send, uh, there's five of us going uh, uh, about five or six days early just to make sure that when our folks land, we get them uh, taken care of, yep. get a place, uh, something to eat, get them into the bed to sleep and so that they can come up and start working the next morning. You may have mentioned it and it slipped my mind. Uh, is there an actual date yet, uh, the date that you'll leave? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's leaves in stages from, and that's, that'll take place um, at the end of next week. That'll okay. start leaving and, okay. and just different waves that'll leave. Sure for the different aircraft then. Boy, all the best to you guys. Thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, I was going to mention uh, the fact, too, that uh, uh, as, as you go into uh, South Korea, um, you know, your, your families will be back here. Do you have some kind of communications with the families the entire time you're there? Well, email and cell phones. Okay. The two primary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And mm -hmm. the, the 148th got a new wing commander a few months ago. Oh, we did, yes, yeah. Has that made any changes at the base? Uh, well, you know, there's changes with all, when, when, uh, and that's part of the whole military thing, but Colonel Strafstrom does a great job. You know, he's uh, standing on, some sh on the shoulders of some great leaders before him, and uh, he's going to take us right up to the top, too. Okay, so, very right. good. Wonderful guy. Thank you. Lieutenant Colonel Rob Ronigan. thanks. Thank all you. the best. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's time now for the week's business headlines from Business North. The growth of iron mining and steel making in other parts of the world means Minnesota mines are having a declining impact on the international market. That's what former Fed economist Toby Madden said at the Regional Economic Indicators Forum in Duluth on Tuesday. Madden also said the imposition of tariffs will only provide brief relief for American steel makers that buy iron range ore. He advised area businesses to diversify into areas that depend less on mining and to be prepared for change.
Esser Steel Minnesota has not commented on unattributed reports by the Reuters news agency contending the firm might have to restructure its debt through bankruptcy. The report follows another period when the company has largely stopped construction of its Nashwalk plant. The bonds Esser sold to finance its most recent construction received a junk rating and paid an interest rate of 12%, which is typical of bonds issued by firms having very weak balance sheets. Other divisions of Esser also are struggling, including its Saint, uh, Sault Ste. Marie steel mill and its global steelmaking unit. An employment dispute within Itasca County government has boiled over into an uproar. A recently completed compensation study led Veterans Service Officer Hugh Quinn to resign his position, saying his department was being placed under another jurisdiction. Although he gave 60 days notice, the popular county official permanently departed Wednesday morning after he received an email from County Administrator Trish Heron. County officials refused to release the contents of that communication, but the county board met in special session Thursday and terminated Heron's contract. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. Now, if you have a comment on this week's show, this is the time to call. Dial 218-788-2849 and leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdsc.org and visit the WDSC website for the latest updates on your favorite programs, news about the TV station, and upcoming events. Well, Julie, it's April 1st, and there have been some rather creative additions to the annual April Fool's Day jokes. Yes, now, consider yes. this video released from the North Shore Scenic Railroad in the attempt to outlaw Mr. Smiley Face. And this just in. Lake Superior Court Judge for yourself has outlawed the yellow smiley face in Duluth, effective April 1st. I hereby order. Mr. Smiley Face to leave town forever. Because Duluth's new symbol of happiness is Thomas the Tank Engine, who will again bring thousands of kids joy this August at the Duluth Depot. This lifetime ban covers everything. No more smiley text messages either. Oh, Mr. Face could appeal, but he won't. He's too cowardly. He's yellow. This court has no ulterior locomotives. We simply to choose Thomas. Too many? Yeah, you're probably right. But now it's time for you to share your best train-related pun with us at NorthShoreScenicRailroad.org by June 1st for a chance to win free tickets because they're already selling fast. See you in Duluth this August. And we are certainly all in support of Thomas the Tank Engine here at WDSE WRPT. Yes, a, a pretty popular character I around here. I think so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in northwestern Wisconsin, meanwhile, some interesting goings on. The Bayfield Regional Conservancy announced the new northern Sasquatch Preserve. According to Conservation Director Erica Lang, a generous landowner came forward with the proposal after seeing northern red-haired Sasquatch on his land. The resident donated his land for the preserve to protect the Sasquatch for future generations. And as you can see in the photo, the Conservancy plans on setting up a trail system so hikers can enjoy the beautiful preserve. And I've always wanted to see Bigfoot, Denny. I got a Bigfoot, size 13. Yeah, it's hairy too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, happy April Fool's Day to you and to all of our viewers. For Julie and the crew here at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend, everybody, and be kind.